Hi everyone, my name is Isaiah Fagan. I'm the baritone artist in residence for Opera Colorado, and welcome to Opera Explained, Opera Colorado's blog series where we explain, demystify, and otherwise enlighten opera going lovers about various elements of this fantastic genre. Today we're going to be tackling recitative, how to identify it, and why it matters. Before we dive into the material, we should probably establish why this is important to know. Simply put, one of the most intimidating things about opera as a genre is its sheer proportions. If you've never been to an opera before, being lost in a dramatic work that is three, four, sometimes even five hours long can feel a bit like being lost at sea. By understanding some of the tools and techniques that composers use to structure your operas, you can feel a little bit more at rest. You may not know what is around the corner, but at least you know that a corner is coming. In addition to recitative being used to create structures in the bel canto period and in the classical period, it's also just a definitive part about the development of opera as a genre. How recitative has changed over the years is often a hallmark of one period moving into the next. I hope this video explains recitative and hopefully, before long, you'll be navigating those turbulent waters like a pro. To begin, what is recitative? Well, as the name would suggest, recitative is closely related to recitation or speech. While recitative can lengthen or stretch language slightly for dramatic effect, the defining characteristic of recitative is that it follows speech rhythm or speech patterns. In order to do this, certain forms of recitative, such as secco recitative, don't have a strict or regular beat or pulse. The singer delivers the words on pitch, and the continuo player, or keyboard player, changes chords accordingly. This is perhaps the closest the operatic and the straight play stages ever come to intersecting, as the singer has near complete control over the phrasing of the text. In this example of Secco Recitative, sung by Opera Colorado favorite Stefano De Peppo, you can hear this in wonderful fashion. Listen to how, towards the end of the phrase, Mr. De Peppo slows down and almost pauses for dramatic effect. Insomma, con le buone potrei sapere dalla mia rosina che venne a far colui questa mattina. That high level of sensitivity to the text and dramatic intent is what defines recitative. Of course, not all recitative is secco, and as we will soon discover, when the orchestra becomes involved, things become a little bit more complicated. When a recitative does include the orchestra, it's called recitativo accompagnato, or accompanied recitative. With the addition of the orchestra, coordination between the singer, the conductor, and the ensemble becomes even more important. As a result, unlike secco recitative, Every accompanied recitative has a specific tempo and a regular meter, or a specific number of beats per measure. In order for speech rhythm to continue to play its important role with these newfound constraints, some clever writing techniques are used in the orchestra. For example, in most accompanied recitatives, the singer and the orchestra will trade small phrases, allowing the singer to take slightly more or less time without negatively affecting ensemble cohesion. Listen to these two examples of Ai Giovinta la Causa from Le Nozze di Figaro. Specifically, listen to how both singers take slightly more or less time and deliver the text with slightly different intention. E poi di Antonio, c'è un incognito Figaro ricusa di tali una nipote in matrimonio. E poi di Antonio, che è un incognito Figaro ricusa Operas that utilize this form or this structure, where recitatives are found in between various ensemble or solo numbers, are often referred to as number operas. As opera developed, accompanied recitatives became more and more substantial, with greater interplay and balance between the singer and the orchestra. By the time of Verdi's La Traviata and the Rigoletto, recitatives and arias were beginning to blend more and more to the point where entire selections defied easy classification. My go-to example of this is Parisiamo from Verdi's Rigoletto. Rather than listen to the entire selection, which I highly suggest you do, I'm going to play you the only examples that I can find where there is a regular beat or pulse for any sustained period of time. 
This is odd considering that much of the aria, if we'll call it that, has sustained notes and lines that we would normally associate with arias. But before that, listen to these clips of Parisiamo, sung by Ettore Bastianini. Questo padrone mio, il giovin, giocondo, si può sempre bello, sonnecchiando mi dice, fa chi arrida, buffone. And there you have it. That's the longest portion of this aria that sounds truly aria-like. Now, how we define what sounds like an aria and what sounds like a recitative is coming in just a moment. I would feel remiss if I didn't also play this other section, which faints or teases us into thinking that a long, beautiful aria is coming, but then it's taken away just as quickly as it arrives. So now what? How do we navigate these murky waters? Here's an easy method to help you differentiate between recitatives and arias or other numbers. Just think R and R. Not rest and relaxation, but rhythm and repetition. The rhythm in R and R refers to speech rhythm because, as we've said before, recitative tends to follow speech rhythm. Arias and other numbers, conversely, tend to elongate words in order to create melodic or lyric phrases. A great example of this is the famous Casta Diva from Bellini's Norma, sung here by the incomparable Leontine Price. If you hear a singer sing a series of long, sustained notes like you do in this next selection, that's a pretty good indicator that you're not in a recitative but are in fact in an aria. Also, looking ahead, notice the repeating patterns in the piano highlighted by the red circles as that's going to play an important part. Next is repetition. Not the repetition of words, but of patterns within the orchestra that help create that regular beat we talked about earlier, if you recall the snapping tapping exercise. These repeating patterns or figures help establish a regular pulse and, along with the conductor, help keep the ensemble together. These figures or patterns can happen within recitative as well, but they're never sustained for very long when they do. There are several standard repeating patterns used in opera. I'm particularly fond of the high energy patterns associated with the cabaletta, or the fast finale to multi-sectional arias popular during the early to mid 19th century. One of my favorite cabalettas is Di quella pira from Il Trovatore by Verdi, sung here by Franco Corelli. <laughs> Now the opera aficionados out there are probably saying, hold your horses. What about composers like Wagner, Puccini, and Strauss that don't use the number system? Well, while those composers certainly relied more on themes and leitmotifs to structure their works rather than bel canto composers such as Donizetti, traces of the old system can still be found in even the most avant-garde operas. If you're willing to listen hard enough, you can find repeating patterns in even the most through-composed operas such as in this excerpt from Si Mi Chiama No Mimi from Puccini's La Boheme.
There you have it. That's Richard Tativ. I hope that you found this video informative as well as entertaining. But most importantly, I hope you feel more confident than ever to go out and listen to your favorite operas and perhaps some new ones. Thank you for your support for Opera Colorado, and I hope to see you in the Opera House soon.